Colin Taylor joins us today from Gamecock Central. He's a good buddy of mine in the media business. He covers South Carolina, uh, covers a lot of sports, but we're going to talk baseball today. He does a great job. He's covering a great season. Colin, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Absolutely. I appreciate it, and I'm glad we can talk about good South Carolina baseball Yeah, because the last couple of years it's been hit or miss quite literally for this program, and uh, happy we can be sitting here on – April 5th, talking about a, a team that's 27 and three and off to its best, arguably its best season in, in program history. Well, I, I think the league is better when Carolina is good. It's been kind of hit and miss for the last decade. I think this team is legit for reasons I'll get into later, but let's back up a little bit. Let's mm-hmm. go back two months. And you know, we had Mark Kingston on our show uh, preseason. Uh, he was great. You, you felt there was a sense of optimism. And now you can understand why. But was this the season you thought you'd be covering a couple of months ago? Not to this level. Um, They did a lot. They kind of followed the Texas A&M model from last year where um, you have some solid pitching, but you go hit the transfer portal hard for veteran experienced bats. And they have that. They um, You looked at their roster and said – there's stuff, there are pieces here to work with, but it's got to all kind of coalesce. It's got to come together. You're breaking in a lot of new faces. You're bringing in a new hitting coach and recruiting coordinator and Monty Lee. Um, you have pieces that are really talented to work with, but will you get the most out of them? Um, which hasn't been the strength of South Carolina over the last couple of seasons. You haven't necessarily maximized talent and they're maximizing you can make the case they max maximized this roster last year, despite the struggles. And you could definitely make a case that right now you're maximizing everything, every bit uh, of this roster um, through the first 30 games of the season. But to answer your question, no, I didn't think we'd be covering a, a 27 win team through the first um, 30 games, but it's not shocking just given how, how well things have kind of worked together and all the pieces that you've expected or wanted to hit have hit through the first, um, what is this? seven or eight weeks of the season. Yeah, we're, we're at the halfway point of the regular season, and, and 27 and three is, is pretty loud. But I like to dig in on teams and, mm. you know, see, is this a fluke? And everything I look at with Carolina suggests it's a top eight national seed caliber team. Uh, you look at the predictive computers, I don't know that that gets a lot of attention in college baseball, but most of those have Carolina in the top eight, if not all the ones I've looked at. Um. You know, and, and I look, I start really diving into pitching, right? Because you can look at stats for teams. You can look at stuff in league play. You can look at out of league play. But I look at, like, how many dudes do you have that can get outs? And they got a lot of them. And I think what's amazing, and, and we'll get into the, some of the, the guys that are doing it, but I think you would have thought Sanders and Becker would have both given them more than they've given if if you knew Carolina is going to be 27 and three at this point. So I feel like they've got, I don't know if to say they've got a level above them is, is the right call, but, but, but may, maybe it is if those guys start pitching the way that they can. Yeah. There's another gear that this team from a pitching side of things can hit. And one thing, I mean, you mentioned it, the fact that they're doing it without Will Sanders being ACE level through the first, you know, his, his first six starts says a lot about this group. And Noah Hall is in contention for SEC Pitcher of the Year. Um, Paul Skeens probably has something to say about that. But, I mean, Noah Hall has been one of the best pitchers in the country through the first, you know, six, seven weeks of the season. Uh, going through, dealing with a bit of a back injury right now, um, which caused him to have a rough outing at Mississippi State, but has been elite through the first um, month and a half-ish, two months of the season. So, uh this is the problems last year were just injuries on the pitching staff. You know, you you're having to rely on Matt Becker. You're having to rely on Will Sanders and Noah Hall and Kate Austin to pitch. If, if you needed them to go six, they had to go seven. Like if they gave you six good, you just had to stretch them. And um, you don't have to do that this year. You have dudes and um, Jack Mahoney's coming off injury, you know, back fully from Tommy John, Chris Veach, a transfer had Tommy John last year's back to full health. James Hicks has been arguably their best bullpen option um, towards UCL two games into two starts into last year comes back after getting drafted and has been elite for better or worse for, for most of this season. So 
this is just an insanely deep pitching staff. It's a pitching staff that throws a ton of strikes, is not going to walk a ton of guys. And if you score on them, you've earned it kind of thing. And um, it's a bullpen that's been really, really good through the first, you know, 30 games of the season. Um, you know, a bullpen ERA of 2.54, um, the whip of 1.06. They've only allowed 10 of their 38 inherited runners to score. Um, this is a bullpen that it was a weakness last year for South Carolina. That's an insane strength because they just have guy after guy. Um, and that's huge for South Carolina. I mean, teams are hitting very low against them. You're talking about a team sitting 223 with runners on, 262 with runners in scoring position. They pitch out of jams and they just have guy after guy that can just get after you and throw strikes and if, if they go far, it's because this pitching staff is dominated from top to bottom in this league. Yeah, and, and the hitting will, will have something to do with that, too. With it. That's mm -hmm. also been good. But I look at, again, I, I look at a lot of things when I analyze a team. One of them is, do you have enough guys to get you through a regional or, or, or maybe sometimes a super or once you're in Omaha to, to pitch through that? Although that's a little different. You get days off there. Right. But – you see so many teams that, that, you know, they have an ace or two and then after that it drops off or, or maybe they've got four or five, six guys that can pitch. And then once you get to the Sunday night game, it, it falls apart. Um, they're deep, first of all. And second, they don't beat themselves. I'm going to read you some stats you may not know, but I, I, I've got this crazy sheet in front of me with all kinds of stats that go behind ERA. And I, I, free pass rates, one of them. I look at how often do you issue a walk or a hit by pitch. Noah Hall, 7% of the time. Jack Mahoney, 7% of the time. James Hicks, 5% of the time. Eli Jones, 7%. Eli Jerzenbeck, 5%. Kate Austin, 4%. Chris Veach, 9%. Now, again, when you look at team numbers, you know, it, it's going to be a guy that you leave in and mop up on a Tuesday game that, that gives up eight runs sometimes and walks nine guys or something like that that will – skew the stats when I isolate and say who's going to pitch for them at big spots I like that um home runs were a big thing Carolina's hitting a ton of them but you look at home run rates Noah Hall 1.8 percent that's that's pretty good Mahoney 0.6 percent Hicks 0.9 Jones hasn't given one up yet Veach 2.2 Austin hasn't given one up yet um, Jersey back 2.7 percent. That's that's decent this day and age. Yeah. When I unpack this thing and take all the parts apart and assemble them back together, and again, that's without having Sanders or um oh good grief, the, the other kid we were talking about a minute ago, Becker, who I think are very talented kids pitching the way they can. I, I think even without those guys, Colin, I, I think they've got the horses to to get to Omaha by, on the pitching staff. Yeah, this is 100% an Omaha caliber pitching staff. And I remember I was working on a story about Jack Mahoney uh, before the season started, just him coming back from Tommy John. And great kid, kind of has waited pretty much a year and a half almost, two years to, to pitch back in a competitive game. So um, I was, was writing his story, and uh, I was talking to his high school baseball coach. And he was like, this was right before – this was opening week, so they, they played Friday. And – he goes, you know, when does Jack pitch? And I said, he's their Sunday guy. And I said, he'll go game three. And he kind of paused and went, how many teams would Jack Mahoney be your number three guy with? And I said, not many. I mean, he'd be – Noah Hall would be a Friday Friday arm for most teams in the country. Eli Jerzenbeck would be on the weekend as a freshman for most teams in the country. James Hicks would start for most teams in the country. Matthew Becker started for South Carolina last year and. He's kind of turned a corner. His last two outings, he got roughed up early, but his last two outings have been sensational. He, You have three or four guys that are in, in the bullpen right now that would 100% start for most teams in the country and maybe be your frontline guy. And that's how you win games in Omaha because there's going to be, especially if you get that loser's bracket, whether it's in a regional or if you get to Omaha – you're going to have to spot start a guy depending on how days of rest follow. And you can spot start Eli Jones. You can spot start James Hicks or Jerzenbeck or someone like that and get five or six really good innings out of them. I mean, hell, Eli Jones, you gave Will Sanders the week off in Starkville. 
to get kind of his mind right for the LSU series. And Eli Jones goes out there on a Thursday night in the SEC against Mississippi State's ace and gives up one run on three hits and four innings. And that was kind of what his max was that day. But he's – and even – Tuesday night, last night against North Carolina, Jones comes in. South Carolina just takes the lead in the seventh inning. Jones comes in with one, two, three due up in the North Carolina order. Strikeout looking, strikeout swinging, strikeout looking. I mean, this is a staff that just dominates and throws strikes, and um, they're so deep. This is probably – South Carolina had a really good pitching staff in 2021, another Omaha-level caliber staff. This staff's probably deeper with the amount of – talented guys you can throw out there they don't throw as hard as that 2021 staff that was i mean you could trot six dudes out there that were 95 plus but uh just a really good group of strike throwing guys that um don't give up a lot of extra base hits yeah there's guys that throw hard everywhere there's not a lot of guys that know how to pitch and again they've got a bunch and you bring up a good point that midweek game against carolina now i don't know how much midweek factors into when we analyze a team but where where it's Maybe a place we look at is you you get you drop a game you're not supposed to in a regional. Do you have the dudes who can can pick you up that you weren't planning on pitching? And I'd say beating Carolina, North Carolina, that is five nothing in midweek is is a pretty good indicator of of that too, as you pointed out. Yeah, and and that was a game that was tied going into the seventh inning. Um, South Carolina needed its pitching. Normally in midweeks, you're like, okay, we'll just out slug you because you're throwing you know, some guys that are needing development stuff, but South Carolina's won midweek games like three, one, they've won them like, you know, you know, six, two, they've found ways to have normal pitching games, normal offensive games, or even ho hum offensive games and still win these midweeks because you have pitching depth. Um, Eli Jones and Eli Jerzenbeck are pitching on midweeks for South Carolina. Matthew Becker's starting midweek games for you. Like, you know, Eli Jerzenbeck's a dude that, you know, if, if the development tracks, number one, he turned down gobs of money to come to school. And his his slider has a spin rate of like 3,300 RPM. I mean, it's a big league level slider. And he's pitching on a midweek. You're Presbyterian. You're USC Upstate seeing that. You don't see that all the time. And uh, when you have that and the depths that they're able to trot out there because they don't stretch guys out on the midweek so that, you know, Matthew Becker and Jerzenbeck and Jones are going to be available on the weekend. That's a luxury. A lot of teams don't have in this sport to where you can trot that out there on your bullpen. You have starter quality, starter caliber guys in the bullpen that not a lot of teams have. And um, it's how they won game three against Missouri. Um, They were in a extras and Missouri's having to trot out their center fielder to pitch five innings just because they were so thin South Carolina's Becker throws three pitches out of an insane jam. And then they just one inning, one inning, one inning, each guy gets an inning and just mows them down and they're able to outlast teams, um, which is how you got to do it sometimes when you're in a regional or super regional trying to get to Omaha. Well, the other thing they do that's problematic if you're playing them is they hit a lot of home runs, which is a far cry from kind of where they were. Although I feel like they hit a few a year ago. They just didn't they get on base a lot. This year yeah. they're, they're doing everything. You look at the lineup, Ethan Petrie has, has been tremendous, one of the best freshmen in the country. Gavin Cassis, the transfer from Vanderbilt. Braylon Wimmer having his best year. Uh, Cole Messina has been great. Uh, Will McGillis, when he's played, has been phenomenal. Um Carson Hornig has been good. I mean, what it's one thing to have two or three guys in a lineup that you're concerned about. It's another to have six or seven. And again, I I would rather face a team that's top heavy and you have to worry about getting a couple guys out than a team that when you get six, seven deep, you're like, I, I better be careful because this guy can do some damage here. And that's that's the other thing Carolina's got. Yeah, they're last year was such a tough year offensively. Pitching wise, the injuries were the main reason why that pitching staff just did not have really good numbers. Offensively, you have Andrew Eister and you have Braylon Wimmer and you have Josiah Seitler coming back, really entrenched good hitters. You bring in a transfer in Brant Belk, who had a really good year for you um, as your leadoff guy, but you didn't have anything outside of that. You're starting a ton of freshmen Michael Braswell, Talmadge Lee Croy, um, Carson Horning to a degree. You're pl- and you're just playing a ton of freshmen. And it's one thing to be a freshman pitcher. 
because 95 from the right side with that break up with the good breaking balls, 95 and a good breaking ball, but being a hitter as a freshman is really tough. And so this year, not only do those Cole Messina's Talmadge Lee Croy's Carson Hornings, um, Michael Braswell, now that he's playing, they've gotten a year older and they're more experienced. You've added Braylon Wimmer back into the fold who turned down money to come back to school for one more year. You got older with bringing in Gavin Casas, with bringing in Caleb Denny, with bringing in Will McGillis, who've been multi-year players at programs. Caleb Denny and, and McGillis were multi-year starters at their schools before coming to South Carolina. You add the element of veteran experience and you bring in a left-handed bat. Like, I mean, you know Gavin as well as anybody. Like, you bring in a left-handed bat with that much power. Uh, it's terrifying to hit to, to pitch to this unit because, um, you know, just looking at it, Caleb Denny is off to a really tough start in league play, but has, you know, a ton of home runs on the year, um, has hit a couple grand slams. Um, this team just gets on base, and that's the part that's been missing the last couple of years, that they're re- they were really good at hitting home runs, that they could do things like that. And But if it's a home run, it's a solo shot. It's a two-run shot. Now they're hitting multiple two-run shots in games. They're walking a ton. They might be striking out a, maybe a little bit too much, but they've either walked or gotten hit by a pitch 66 times, if I'm doing my math right, in nine league games. So they work counts. They take advantage of free passes, which they haven't done in years past. Um, you're hitting eight, 284 as a team through nine SEC games and getting on base at a 410 clip. Is that replicable when you're, you know, you got LSU, Vanderbilt, Florida over your next three? We'll see, but – um, this is a group that is just grinds out at bats and we talk about outlasting. This is a group that will outlast you. And if you're, if they're in games late and you, another team has to get to their bullpen, you got dudes that can really take advantage of that. And we haven't even talked about Ethan Petrie, who, you know, the season ended today would probably be SEC freshman of the year. Um, so it's a, it's a dangerous offense and they got a chance you never count this team out just because of the the veteran experience that they have and just the the power that they can hit for. Yeah, I'm looking off a stat sheet that's a day old, but they've got seven guys that before that UNC game, I think we're getting on at 450 or higher that had a, a reasonable number of at bats. It's that's hard. To get <laughs> yeah, <to. laughs> now, now some of that's going to come down to earth because some of yeah. that is you know, you're playing. CN on a on a frozen day right. or somebody like that in, in a February and you know they they're going to walk or hit 15 guys and so you know that that's going to come down to earth eventually but mm. but still I mean it's it's pretty impressive and and they've they've hit the ball in league play a little bit too um you know the the, the pitching depth again that's that's kind of where I separate teams and you talked about the series coming up I think the one with Vandy in a few weeks is going to be interesting here yeah. in my backyard because in my in my mind, that's the two best pet pitching staffs in the league in terms of depth and quality. Um, you know, Kentucky's got an argument. Tennessee, if those guys pitch the way they do, is going to have an argument. Um, you know, if Florida's starters come back and, and pitch the way they can, which they haven't lately, they're going to have an argument. But, you know, and, and I don't know if I mentioned Kentucky. Kentucky's pieced it together with a lot of guys and, and done well. But I think right now, Vaney and Carolina – in my mind, are the, are the two staffs that I, I probably want to see the least because of how they're put together. Which brings me to some of the series you talked about. You know, Florida will be coming up, but LSU this weekend. You know, Tennessee last weekend, Colin, I don't know if you're aware, when Paul Skeens wasn't pitching, uh, the, the Vols had more runs scored off pitchers not named Skeens than, than those guys had innings pitched. Mm-hmm. Now, now, sometimes that falls apart on you, and, and Thatcher Hurd is not going to probably have another game where he doesn't get an out. But, um, you know, I, it's going to be a tough nut to crack schemes in, in that game one. But I think after that, you can argue that the advantage tilts Carolina's way just because of pitching depth. Now, some of that's going to be what does Floyd give him? How much does LSU pitch Garrett Edwards, who's really good, and some other guys? But t- to me, especially that when being in Carolina, you get past Friday and take skeins out of it. That's where, to me, the advantage probably tilts in Carolina's favor. You would like to hope. And a lot of that hinges too on Noah Hall's availability right now. 
Um, we'll talk to, to Mark Kingston. Um, we're recording this 11 of four Eastern, but he'll talk later today and probably give an update. You know, me personally, I, I don't think Noah Hall is going to pitch this weekend just because his back seized up on him in that started Mississippi state and the back's a tricky thing. And um, you just never know. So you're probably, if I had to guess right now, it'd be Sanders Thursday, Mahoney Friday, and then TBA on Saturday. And in reality, the weather here is so gunky, you might not get Friday or Saturday's game in just because it's supposed to rain. Um, I think from the jump on Friday morning throughout all the weekend. Um, so Thursday might be the only game you play, but if you're South Carolina, you kind of have to put all your eggs maybe in that basket and you got to get skeins out early. You got to get Goodwill Sanders, but you have the depth in that bullpen to keep LSU down offensively. Now, easier said than done with you know, Cruz and Morgan and that crew, but you have a chance in, in that game, especially if you can get the skeins and maybe not score off of them, but, you know, work the pitch count, get him uncomfortable. That atmosphere is going to be unreal Thursday night. Um, it's going to feel like a super regional game. Just that that's how it's going to be. So if you can get skeins out, yeah, you hope. And then you have the pitching depth to compete with LSU. If you get those next two games in, um, this is going to come down to the bullpens, I think. And what offense can, what offense can get that clutch hit late? What off, what pitching staff can get out of a jam late? But yeah, if you get through game one and win or lose, you feel pretty good if you're South Carolina going into, um, you know, games two and three, if they get played, because you've done it all year, you've bounced back. I don't, they have not lost consecutive games all season. Uh, You lose that opener to Clemson for your first loss of the season. You come back and win in dramatic fashion on Saturday, and then you club them on Sunday to win the series. Um, you obviously lose a midweek to Charlotte, and then you come back and you beat Missouri in dramatic fashion, sweep that series. You lose game two to Mississippi State, get run ruled, and then you club them late on um, on in that Saturday game three. So this is a team that knows how to respond to adversity because they're old, and th- I think that's going to be a big advantage as you look ahead to the final 18 innings of that series if they do end up getting played. Yeah, and, and you mentioned – Skeens. I mean, that's a thing. Like, even if you can get him out after five, even if he's effective, run up the pitch count rather than have him go eight or nine. You you eat into the bullpen, and that's where LSU's, you know, outside Edwards and a couple guys, yeah, <laughs> relatively vulnerable. I mean, look, everybody pitching is is it's so hard to pitch in college baseball right now, and and the teams that really have the depth of arms like Carolina has, you can you can count them on maybe two hands. Right. So I'm not being critical of LSU. It's a, it's an elite team, but I'm not sure if you break down the matchup at that point, that's where, again, I, I think Carolina might have an edge. But I want to ask you, you've seen something recently, uh, Easter weekend teams going more to Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, I think you've only got one series that starts on a Friday, so you'll only have one Easter Sunday baseball game if it plays out like it's scheduled. Um. Do, do they go into Sunday if, if they need to at, at that point? Or how's that going to work in terms of rain if games get postponed and such? Yeah, I think I think the SEC rule is if it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you only get three game, three days to play three games. So they won't roll over to Sunday. And Sunday in Columbia doesn't look a whole lot better than Friday, Saturday, if we're going to be honest, which um, kind of puts a dent into my Easter Sunday Masters watching plans, too, with Augusta only being an hour from here. But yeah. Um, yeah, it, they, it'll just be one of those where you either play two of the three and scrap game three or you play one of the three and scrap the other two because it's going to be really hard as we sit here right now looking at the weather to get 18 innings, even nine innings maybe over the course of those two games or two days. Um, so we'll see what that looks like. But right now I'm not too optimistic all three games get played this weekend at Founders Park. Well, well, I hope you're wrong about that. Me now too. I'm going to ask you a tougher question. Um, how in the world do you pitch to Dylan Cruz? You just give him the, the Barry Bonds, you know, you might have to treatment have to. and just say take take your base. Yeah, you might have to. I mean, you just hope you hope that you don't release the ball too early and you leave it up in the zone and he can put a good swing on it. I mean, that's one of those where 
Uh, <laughs> you you pepper the knees, and if he puts a good swing on a ball that is out of the zone or whatever, you you say great job. But um, yeah, I, there's no way I would pitch give him anything to hit anytime he's up the base, and I might just give him the Barry Bonds. Enjoy your intentional walk, but you're not going to beat us. Uh, approach to the series. We, we've seen some great hitters in this league, and, and I've I've watched the SEC for 20 years. Dylan, it, might it, be. and this this is not easy. Like I've seen, you know, in Nashville, I've seen JJ Bleday and Austin Martin, some guys like that that were pretty special. Pedro Alvarez, um, you know, and, and countless other guys across the other teams. I think if you say who's the best hitter I've seen in 20 years. I, I mean, it, it's it, it's well. I mean, there's not many things where I say there's no debate. Like if you say best pitcher, and, and by the way, that that could be Skeens too. I've <laughs> yeah. seen a lot of good ones, but I, I I can't think of a guy that if I put him head to head with Cruz, I'm like that guy comes out ahead. I I really think that's that's kind of it feels like an easy discussion. Yeah, and over the last twenty years, he's the best. Yeah, I mean, and and the stats bear it out, and it's not just a one off thing. He's been the best hitter in the SEC. Maybe the, I mean, since the moment he stepped foot in Baton Rouge and how a kid like that even gets to campus at, at a school is still just bewildering to me. And uh, I think it's good, obviously, for the sport, but not good for South Carolina, <laughs> Tennessee, Arkansas, Texas a and any of the schools they got to face. But I mean, yeah, it's one of those where, like you said, you could talk pitching and you know, I've covered South Carolina, watched South Carolina my entire life. I'd probably have an answer. Every fan base would probably be like, oh, no, we have this pitcher that's done this or that. But it's hard to think of anyone else that even comes close to where Dylan Cruz is right now. And um, you're probably talking about if the season ended right now, you're probably talking about the SEC pitcher, hitter, and freshman league are all converging on South Carolina, South Carolina's campus this weekend with Skeens, Cruz, and then obviously Ethan Petrie. Yeah, okay. I'm I'm gonna really put you on the spot here. You're like, like the Pirates have got the first pick this year, I think. Yeah, it's Cruz. I'm Does going Cruz. Right? Yeah, I'm going Cruz. I, well, I was gonna say, I mean, I that's what I thought too, but did you see Skeen's pitch against Tennessee? <laughs> yes. Oh <laughs> my goodness. I, it's one of those where like I've thought about it for a while. Dylan Cruz you're fast tracking both of those guys probably to the big leagues once they get drafted and signed for gobs of money. But Dylan Cruz can be like your leadoff man, starting center fielder for 15 years. If you're the, or your cleanup you know, guy. Yeah. Oh, I mean like wherever you want to put it. Yeah. Wherever you insert him into a lineup and he'll be your starting center fielder. But um, he's just two generational talents. And I think Jay Johnson told Kendall Rogers or somebody, I saw the quote on Twitter, like, Skeens is like the best pitching prospect since Steven Strasburg because, you know, Jay was obviously out West when Strasburg was doing all that stuff, but it's, it'd be hard given how, you know, the offensive game is changing in baseball now, not to take a guy like Dylan Cruz. If I'm the pirates with that one, one pick, just because of how special, just truly special he is as a hitter. Yeah, and and you brought up you know well two things the defense is there yeah uh, he, he, I don't know that he's Enrique Bradfield in center but if you can play center and, and project as a major league center fielder with with that kind of bat that's one and and number two the thing you've hit on is he's done it since he's been at LSU I mean he's been up I think he's been north of four twenty four thirty on base since his freshman year and that's another thing it, it's not just this was a and the people that watch this know this it wasn't like it's a pop-up season he's been a dude ever since he got on campus yeah. right and there's something to be said for that that you have a track record like that against and you're not pitching podunk mid-major conference you're pitching against the sec and doing it against and the sec west right like you did that although against, the east, east has got the jump yeah. this year but traditionally the west has yes been i mean you're doing that against high level pitching i mean not only lsu's arms and fall ball or whatever i don't know what his fall and, and preseason numbers are against that pitching staff at lsu but um you're doing that against arkansas and a&m and all, the Auburn teams that have been solid over the last couple of years with some good pitching to go along with it. I mean, just the track record speaks for itself and it'd be hard if I'm the pirates, like I said, to not take that dude one, one. 
Yeah, it's 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 a tougher because I was there with you, and then Schemes yeah. was so good in that game. I'm like, well, wait a minute, you don't you don't see 102 with three other good secondary pitches that are working. Right. Um, like one or two in like the fourth inning, fifth inning. Like it's not just like it's yeah. you're popping the mitt in the first. Like that's I mean it was velocity. it was it was something. Yeah, uh, you you don't you don't see you don't see anything like what either of those guys have. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of great baseball players yes. in this league. But um, well, Colin, I appreciate your time today. I know you've got to run to a media thing. Um, man, I'm hoping we get all the three of these games. In, I cannot wait to see that series. Um, yeah. Tell folks where to follow your coverage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, come on over to GamecockCentral.com, part of the On3 Sports Network. Um, you can find us at Gamecock Central on every social media. And I'm at Twitter at Colin Taylor, um, just all one word, C-O-L-L-Y-N, and the Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. Come engage and keep up with one of baseball's, I guess, surprise stories over the course yeah. of the first part of the season is – South Carolina tries to keep it up in, in what is going to be just a gauntlet of uh, a five or six game, five or six weekend stretch for them. Well, uh, say hi to the good folks at Gamecock Central, Chris Clark, and all my buddies over there, Brian Shoemaker. Um, just really, I've always enjoyed the company of, of the guys it. on your staff. You're, you're some of the best dudes in the business. You're great at what you do. And Colin, I have a feeling I'm going to have the occasion to have you on again, whether it's an, cool. another couple series postseason yes. something but uh boy it's been it's been fun to watch from a distance i know it's been fun to cover and, and thanks for coming on with us today absolutely appreciate it and can't wait to get up to nashville next weekend and get to watch those two yeah. teams duke it out up in uh up, right. at, up at vandy yeah that's that's a good point we may we may be having this conversation <laughs> in a week but uh <laughs> anyway uh he's colin taylor i'm chris lee of southeastern 14 presented by bearded iris Thanks for watching. If you like this, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. We got all kinds of baseball content coming up uh, between now and the the last pitch of Omaha. And and I think you're going to love what you get here. Again, thank you for watching. We'll see you again soon at Southeastern 14.